A Mike Flanagan monologue is never what it seems. Some people love it, some people hate it. And I do agree that sometimes it can be just a tangent that just goes on and on and on and on. Where these characters, who at first had such a hard time expressing their feelings, suddenly turn into these social butterflies, where they weave and mince through words, while the other person finally could just sit down, shut up, and listen in on their psyche. It is a make-or-break type of deal for Flanagan's work, because almost every character has a sob story that goes along with them, or an epiphany that they suffer through so the story can progress. Epiphany. I mean, even after everything I've said, I adored his characters, okay? Even after everything they've done, I identify precisely with their pain. Because I am attracted to broken people. And almost all of them are damaged, right? <laughs> you gotta admit though, the most compelling characters there are, are the ones that are damaged. Would you really watch a drama for, for, from a family who is well off? No, why would you? Why would you watch a drama with no stakes at all? No urgency to tend to? It's boring. Why would you do that? Broken objects? No. Why? There's no purpose for them. But broken people. A person who is on a knife's edge of becoming deranged. <laughs> There's a certain attraction to it. A certain pull that made me feel to want to become a better person. <laughs> as selfish as that idea is conceived <laughs> undoubtedly it is but you gotta admit there is a certain beauty in watching some person wallowing in their sadness and pain there just is and you know what it shouldn't matter anyway they're all fake it's all fake it's all just fabricated. Their pain, fabricated. Their misery, their mysteries, it's all just a bunch of bullcrap. It's all done and made for our enjoyment. So why should monologues matter? Why should the ideas or thoughts of some fictional people should matter to us who actually have to suffer through their problems in real life, day to day, every day? <laughs> why? There is no protagonist or antagonist in our real life story. We're all just minor characters against the universe. <sighs> minor characters against the universe. So, so why should the thought of something or someone should sometimes matter as much or more than thought that comes from our own consciousness, right? Man, did I just do mon- No matter what I say, I can totally understand that Mike Flanagan's work could either bore you to tears or it could enamor you to the screen like no other medium. Even though I know Mike Flanagan's work should be known as the giant creepy scarefest that it is, it does a giant discredit on why his horrors work so well. I do realize there is a divide among the horror fan base, and the divide is also the main reason which kinds of movies or any kind of horror media is being produced by big executives or producers. And I can't really blame it on the disparity since slow burn horrors are either a make or break kind of type of deal. As I said before, there are a lot of reasons why people gravitate towards common horror tropes. Because it is cheap thrills, which I want to preface again, isn't particularly or exactly ba a bad thing. I'll only consider if it's bad when it suffocates its predecessor existence. Which, considering how popular my clan is lately, it's not really that true. So I'll let it slide. 
I call it cheap flows not because of its actual cost of making it. Making bad movies still need buttloads of money. I'm saying it's cheap in its required investment from the audience's attention. Sure, there'll be characters with motivations and desires in the story, as in every other story known to man. But most of the time, the whole reason of their existence is to be the catalyst of the scares and heart attacks that are incoming. <coughs> These characters are, act more like vessels for the audience's enjoyment rather than being actual contextualized characters. Because they are, like I said, two halves of an audience. One that participates in jump scares and heart attacks, and one who asks for just a little bit more. And this is where Mike Flanagan and his long-winded words of monologues come into the picture. Because, to be honest, there really isn't more an antithesis than Mike Flanagan and his monologues with cheap horror. His monologues are a big reason why. Tangent is a big word I had and would use to describe it. These long-winded rants that doesn't necessarily correlate would be tied at the end like a neat little bow. A present, if you will. For the audience who bear witness and know that if you stick with the monologues, you would be presented with something that is a little bit special. A lot of standout monologues would come into my mind. Most of them are from the TV show. There's Nell's confetti monologue. Sheriff Hassan's on Dignity, Mr. Dudley's on the dangers of Hill House, Riley Flynn facing his death, Jamie and his Moonflower, Theo's confession, Danny and the Lady of the Lake, and Monsignor's and his forbidden love. Being a big part of his series, Flanagan's Mola could essentially be categorized. They are the penultimate conversations with their characters in conflict, in which it would lead to the monologue's death, like between Stephen Crane and his father, and Royal Flynn coming to terms with his death. And there is also for those who had already suffered from their actions and accepted their resolutions and are there to warn the others like Sheriff Hassan did with his washed up career and the Dudleys with their daughter. And for the very special case and one of my favorite monologues of Mike Flanagan's is Father Paul's confession where the characters admit their wrongdoings and essentially give expositions for the audience. But I'd argue it was on the contrary it would be so easy to vomit out simple expositions to, for the audience. Yet Father Paul delivered it with so much passion and so much grit that it borderlines on the insane and deluded, which he very much was. Clouded by the thought of salvation for everyone at Crockett Island, that the thought of meeting a vampire is even possible never crossed his mind. And that the only rationale from a person with that much religious zealousness is that it was an angel sent from the heavens. And only later, by the end of the series, we realize how flawed his character was. Not in terms of his overzealousness and or the indirect pain he had caused to the people at Crockett Island, but on how he sinned against God by betraying his very own words. And we know the main reason that he went through hell to get that vampire to Crockett Island is to so he can pass on the same gift he was given to his past love, his reason to sin. And looking back, after finishing the show, it was all felt throughout that monologue. The realization, the power he holds, the honest retrospection he had for his own life. He realized he was sinning, but he made the rationale that it was for the greater good to have one final conversation with his past love without the massive ailment they have disturbing them. Judgment as swift as his cloud had permitted him. He brought the vampire home and confessed for his sins. Each and every one of these monologues add a little bit of something different, each with its own quirk and incremental passages. But it all still stuck to my head because of how profound they are. The long takes, the heartfelt pauses, the desperate need to finish what they need to say before they fall apart. It all felt like more of a stage play than a high-budget Netflix series. Annabeth Gish, who has played in numerous Mike Flanagan TV series roles, had this to say about how to nail a Mike Flanagan model. Well, it's always such a pleasure to work with a filmmaker who luxuriates in his characters being allowed to speak. Because uh, sometimes it's just so pithy otherwise. But uh, it, it took a lot of preparation. And then the, the grace of working with Kate and Alex, who listened. You know, who really you could feel 
when your fellow actors are investing in what you are saying and hearing rather than just like, okay, your line, your line, your line, my line. <laughs> I never went to a play before. And I know that monologues are a key part of them because it's the way of characters expressing their emotions. Starting out as dialogue before finally dissolving the entire person entirely. And you know what the funny thing is? I don't think I can manage to do a stage play without yawning. And yet, I wish I could wipe my memory of these monologues from Mike Flanagan's and experience them for the first time again. But this rant that I'm on, which is essentially a monologue, is not exactly to change another person's mind about it. If you don't like monologues, especially Mike Flanagan's one, you surely won't believe whatever I have to say. I can neither say it's a lost art, or if his monologues, Mike Flanagan's, is actually the best there is. I mean, I just made the whole point on how subjective the media is. I just listed reasons why I admire people who confess their feelings in one continuous take. And probably, there is a small part inside of me where I wish I could imitate that in my life. So, no matter how absurd that sounds. There is a small part of me that wish I can do that in real life. Having one continuous take of uninterrupted monologue either confessing my love to someone or proclaiming my death. Maybe I really gravitate towards monologues because of how exclusive the idea it is towards literature and how I enjoy reading Murakami's long-winded rants about life. It is really an exclusive idea for a character to rant about something, something they want. And I know that is objectively wrong. There are so many monologues I can pick out other than Mike Flanagan's in cinema. But there is just something so inherently raw and emotional when I read someone's thoughts unfiltered. Even though I know it was edited by an editor and was thought carefully by the writer. That it is so raw and jumbled and not exactly coherent, right? I mean that is how our mind functions. Scattered memories and scattered thoughts not forming any sentences but feelings. No matter how corny that sounds. I find it so exclusive the idea to literature because of how absurd the idea of letting someone monologuing in real life. Do you Have you ever had something like that happen to you? Where you either burst into a monologue or you would suffer through someone else's. Eloquent words lined up in their thoughts. Which is, sounds way too formal for normal folk. But that is the point. Fiction is there to paint an unrealistic piece of reality and that is why we pay so much sometimes to see to see what we want even if it's real or fake nobody cares it could be as far-fetched as a story about an epic grand fantasy or it could be as simple as having a few poetic lines written down and being recorded without being interrupted and little things always does it for me thank you for watching